Time is strange in movies. A two hour long film can take place over the course of anywhere from actually two hours to an entire lifetime. A countdown timer for 15 minutes usually lasts around 30 if it needs to. A single day can feel like an entire era in someone's life. The manipulation of time is one of the clearest and most obvious ways in which a film can manipulate an audience's perception of reality itself. A movie has the power to make you believe in a fantasy world of elves and orcs, a world where a man can fly or a galaxy far, far away. We are aware that it is a fiction. We understand these people and worlds aren't real and these events did not occur. And yet when a character dies, we feel grief as though we truly knew them like a friend. When the world is saved, we feel the relief as though our world was in just as much danger. When a crew of astronauts enters a wormhole, time and space bending around them to take them to a strange and foreign galaxy. We feel the fear and the wonder as though we were in the ship alongside them. Christopher Nolan's 2014 science fiction epic Interstellar is a film that understands this well. It is a movie that utilizes every last aspect of this medium to create something meant to enrapture your every sense and envelop you totally and completely. A film that seeks to stand as a testament to the power of cinema and all its moving parts to transport you into a reality that is not real, but that feels real all the same. It's a movie I didn't connect with back in 2014. I remember it being a movie that a lot of people didn't connect with, actually. There were discussions of how the film prioritized spectacle over story, its characters were too thin, its story too overcomplicated. And I agreed with all of those criticisms. On some level, I still do. But when I rewatched this movie not that long ago, I found my perspective on it start to change. I found myself entranced and moved. I felt it. For the first time, I felt it. And so today, I want to talk about Interstellar. I want to re-engage with this movie to find the heart that lies within. I want to explore and re-examine a story that I didn't use to connect with and find the reason why I do now. And the way I want to do that is by going through the movie from the beginning. Interstellar can fairly easily be split into four separate acts, and so I'm going to, one act at a time, explore the themes, characters, and craft of Interstellar to try and understand how Christopher Nolan and every everyone else involved created a movie out of pure feeling that brought me as a viewer to the edge of the universe and back. But before we head out, let's hear about this video's sponsor, Bespoke Post. Bespoke Post is a monthly membership club that sends you a box of awesome top shelf goods. 90% of the products come from small brands, many of which are based right here in the US. Every month they introduce members to a wide selection of new products from outdoor gear to home and kitchen goods to clothing and more based on a preference quiz you fill out when signing up. Every box of awesome has around $70 worth of goods inside but costs a fraction of the value. And if you're worried about getting something you won't like, you can preview your box before it's shipped and you can choose to either keep it swap it for a different box, or even skip the month entirely for no charge. You only pay for what you want. Bespoke Post sent me a few boxes, including the Weekender box that came with the Weekender bag, a really nice, durable, high-quality bag for travel and overnight trips, as well as the Swivel box, which included the Revolve magnetic tray and my new favorite pen, the Tigerwood Rollerball pen. This one's been a game-changer for me since my desk was littered with little things I needed but had no place for. But now they just all go in here. Bespoke Post is free to to join, you can skip any month you'd like and you can cancel anytime you want. To get 20% off your first box of awesome, click the link in the description and enter Story Street 20 at checkout or go to bespokepost.com slash Story Street 20. And now that that's out of the way, let's take our seat in the theater. Get comfortable, turn your phone off, pay attention. The lights are dimming, the curtains are being pulled back. Take a moment, a pause, just to prepare yourself for whatever might be coming. Are you ready? The weed had died. The blight came and we had to burn it. And we still had corn. We had acres of corn. But uh, mostly we had dust. Interstellar opens on a grim future. Something known simply as the blight has been ravaging crops for seemingly decades. And as the world ran out of food, the world chose to restructure its priorities. Most people became farmers to try and combat the problem through sheer numbers. But every year, another crop goes extinct saying it's the last harvest for okra ever 
And the Blight itself is an interesting thing that I think is worth starting on, because not only is it associated with what I think is one of the most important criticisms of Interstellar, I think it also helps to show us something important about Christopher Nolan as a director and his ability to manipulate our perceptions. It doesn't take a genius to look at the Blight and the general situation of Earth and Interstellar and see significant similarities to both the American Dust Bowl of the 1930s, as well as our current struggles with climate change and its effect on the world's agriculture culture and food supply. And I don't think it takes an expert on either of those things to also see that it's kind of a piss poor allegory for either mainly for one key reason. There is little to no implication that humanity had any role to play in the creation of the blight. While both the Dust Bowl and climate change are well understood to have been caused in no small part by the impact of human actions, the blight is characterized very much as a natural force. It's something that simply showed up one day and humans just had to learn to deal with it, which almost immediately invalidates it as any kind of direct allegory for either of those things. And I think this is an important and necessary criticism of Interstellar, but I do want to give a slightly different perspective on it. While I can't speak definitively to Christopher Nolan's intentions or even his thoughts on climate change, I do think there's a different way to look at the blight that follows with Nolan's love for manipulating our sense of reality and our feelings towards the fiction of his stories. I look at the blight not not as a direct allegory for either the Dust Bowl or climate change, but instead as a way to utilize the imagery and ideas behind those things, the image of dust storms and the idea of progressively failing agriculture, to evoke a feeling of existential threat as the people of Earth face something of a mass extinction event, more similar to the effects of the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs than the melting of the ice caps. Those things are much more recent and familiar to a modern audience, and while it's difficult to relate to the idea of an asteroid destroying most life on Earth, it's frighteningly easy to relate to the fear of eventually running out of food. Nolan seems to be utilizing that relatability to help the audience feel the same level of threat that the characters of this movie feel, while still making the Blight itself something completely unique to their experience, manipulating our understanding of our reality to influence our feelings towards the film's reality and the actions of its characters. And this is something that is very easy to find in Nolan's previous work. The filmography of Nolan is a list of films about perception and perspective. Memento is a movie about how facts, when put in the right order in the right context, can create a completely different narrative from what's actually true. The Prestige is a film about men seeking the total truth behind illusions and finding only the darkest parts of themselves. Inception is a film that questions the very notion of reality as a concept. Is it even possible to be 100% certain that what we perceive is actually real. As a director, Nolan loves to play with an audience's perception. He is very aware of how rocky a foundation our understanding of the world is built on. How if you simply change the order in which you lay down the pieces, the puzzle can come out as an entirely new image. And Nolan is also very aware of the power of film to facilitate that manipulation in order to make a point. And I think one of the main reasons Nolan has become a near master of this is one key factor that can be seen clearly in his handling of the blight. His main concern, above all else, is how the audience Feels. You see, Nolan doesn't simply structure his films in odd ways, he doesn't simply choose topics that are directly about questioning reality, what he does is ask you to feel. Nolan is a director of ideas who uses film as a medium by which to communicate those ideas through feeling. He turns those ideas into spectacle, gives them a gravity to entrance you or a dread to disturb you. I think contrary to popular belief, Nolan is not a director that wants you to think first. He's a director that wants you to feel first. Because while our reasoning mind will be able to put the pieces back together into a sensible whole, our feeling mind, our emotions, are not nearly as capable of that. And while the blight may be a deeply imperfect allegory for climate change, I think it works really well as a means by which to instill a sense of fear into an audience that goes beyond simply telling them that the world is going to end. Does that let Interstellar completely off the hook for being a bad climate change allegory? Not really. I don't think you can completely separate 
separate these images and ideas from their real world equivalents, and the unwillingness of Interstellar to acknowledge the human role in these things is a real failing. But I do believe that this concept of manipulating our reality through the relatable and familiar is a great starting point to looking at this movie and what it's trying to achieve. And I think the best way to move forward with that is to look at the humans themselves. Interstellar has two co-protagonists, Cooper and Murph. Cooper is a former engineer and pilot who worked for NASA before everything went to hell and became a farmer like everyone else after NASA got shut down, living with his father-in-law Donald, his oldest child Tom, and his young daughter Murph, an endlessly curious and intelligent girl who seems to be much closer to her father than anyone else. She's named after Murphy's Law, the idea that if something can go wrong, it will. But Cooper and his late wife had a different understanding of that law. Murphy's Law doesn't mean that something bad will happen. What it means is that whatever can happen will happen, and that sounds just fine with us. And while the two of them are notably very close, their relationship is clearly defined by a singular, fundamental disagreement. I thought you were the ghost. Oh, man, no such thing as ghosts, man. Something is knocking things off the bookshelves in Murph's bedroom. And while Murph views it as a ghost, Cooper is incredibly dismissive of the phenomenon as a whole. Murph thinks that something is trying to communicate with her, while Cooper basically ignores it. The fundamental difference here is that while Murph is acknowledging there is something happening, that something doesn't fit into Cooper's paradigms of reality, and so he is dismissive of its very existence. Murph starts with something of a hypothesis. This thing in my room is a ghost, and from there she does what her father tells her to do. Don't just tell me that you're afraid of some ghost. No, you gotta go further. You gotta record the facts, analyze, get to the how and the why, then present your conclusions. But whenever she presents any conclusions or any progress in her analysis, he pushes against it, acts like it's nothing. Because while Murph started with a hypothesis and is now trying to follow the observable facts towards a conclusion, Cooper started with a conclusion, a belief that this isn't really anything, and is thus refusing to acknowledge the facts of what's happening to preserve that conclusion. It's one person who sees something they don't understand and seeks to understand it, and one person who sees something they don't understand and rejects it as meaningless, insubstantial, and not worth pursuing. Cooper is only willing to truly acknowledge Murph's ghost when he literally can't deny it, and even then, only when he can put it into terms that he understands. It's not a ghost. It's gravity. Only when this new information is tethered to something familiar is he willing to look further into it and treat it with validity. And whatever this anomaly is, it manages to communicate with them through binary and give them the coordinates to a secret NASA base that has been working to find a new planet for the human race to call home. Recognizing that the blight is only getting stronger, not only taking away our food, but also our oxygen. The last people to starve will be the first to suffocate. And your daughter's generation will be the last to survive on Earth. But they have something on their side. Referred to only as they, these apparent beings are assumed to be the ones who sent Cooper here in the first place, as well as having placed a wormhole near Saturn that leads to a completely new galaxy. NASA sent 12 people into this wormhole and to 12 potentially habitable planets in what was known as the Lazarus missions. Out of those, three planets showed considerable promise, and these are the planets they will be sending a small crew to made up of Drs. Doyle, Romley, and Brand, the last of which is the daughter of the man leading this entire operation, Professor Brand. And they hope for Cooper, a much more experienced pilot, to also be a part of it. And if one of those planets is habitable, there's a Plan A and a Plan B. Plan A is to get everyone off the Earth in gigantic space stations. The only issue being that the stations are so big that they would need to find a way to harness gravity itself as they have in order to get them off the planet. And if they can't, then plan B is to use fertilized eggs to create a colony, saving the human race from extinction, but leaving everyone still on Earth to die. That's why plan A is a lot more fun. 
Did that feel like a lot of exposition? Because yeah, it was a lot of exposition. This is another hallmark of Nolan tied to yet another major criticism of Interstellar. Nolan loves big, complicated ideas. His movies often have high concepts, easily understandable premises, but they are built on very complex, not at all easily understandable details. And so Nolan will often devote entire sequences like this to explaining the minutia of the plot. But that in itself is not the major criticism of Interstellar. I'm talking about. This movie is nearly three hours long. I don't think it's a big deal to take several minutes to make sure your audience is aware of what's going on. No, the criticism I'm talking about is much bigger and more fundamental, and that is that because Nolan's films are often buried in exposition, his characters often become very little else but mouthpieces for said exposition. The characters of Nolan are, generally speaking, very simple. Most of the time, it seems that Nolan's idea of emotional complexity is having children and or a dead wife or girlfriend. Nolan's characters are defined mostly by singular emotions and clear binary emotional conflicts. And as such, there's simply not a whole lot to actually explore character-wise. When they're not speaking in heavy exposition, they're speaking lines that can be called back to later for ironic effect. Nah, that does not make it wrong. It might. That doesn't mean I'm wrong. Honestly, it may. It might or they're speaking in direct and obvious thematic statements. You said science is about admitting what we don't know. She's got you there. Or they're speaking in heavy-handed foreshadowing. Once you're a parent, you're the ghost of your children's future. The characters serve as the plot, not the other way around. They are here to push the plot forward and make sure we don't get lost along the way. They are vehicles for thematic exploration, often becoming themselves simple representations of whatever ideas Nolan is trying to explore. Cooper is a representation of the stubborn unwillingness to engage with new possibilities, and Murph is the more childlike curiosity that leads to new discoveries. They are more symbols than people, but I do feel the need to to acknowledge that simple does not necessarily mean ineffective. And for the stories that Nolan tells, I think these simple characters do work best. Because while Nolan's movies deal with very complex ideas and concepts, he also attempts, with varying degrees of success, to funnel those ideas through the emotional expressions of his characters. While these ideas are so big and so complicated that it leaves no room for more complex motivations, the simplicity of Nolan's characters, the singular nature of their emotions, makes those emotions easily identifiable. Through all the exposition, there is a clear understanding of how all these ideas make these characters feel. All this talk of wormholes and population bombs and nitrogen breathing blight, and it all leads to a little girl devastated by the idea that her father is leaving and may never come back. The ghost in her bookshelf is telling him to stay. It's telling him to stay, but he just won't listen. And to try and calm her down, he gives her a gift, a watch. When I'm up there in hypersleep, or near a black hole, time's gonna change for me. He tries to use a more objectively measurable thing like time, a thing that can be easily defined and calculated, to try to temper her emotions with thoughts of complex concepts. But in doing this, he inadvertently reveals that he doesn't know when he's coming back, and therefore doesn't know if he's even coming back at all. Murph throws the watch against the wall, turns her back, refuses to listen as he promises that he loves her forever, and that he will come back. Some books fall off of the shelf as he leaves, making him turn back one last time, only to turn back around and walk out the door. You might be wondering at this point why I'm taking so much time to talk about all of this, and that can be mostly summed up in a single line from the movie itself. Don't trust the right thing done for the wrong reason. The why of the thing, that's the foundation. I think an important thing to do before we get into the bulk of Interstellar is to consider the foundation, the why of the thing. To ask a very simple but also incredibly complex question. Why did Christopher Nolan make Interstellar? Now that is a question I cannot answer with absolute certainty. I don't know Christopher Nolan as far as I can tell he hasn't said exactly the reason why he wanted to do it and even if he did, I think the reason artists create art is an 
incredibly elusive thing even to artists themselves. But that question is precisely what this first act of the film is setting up as what the movie is going to be about. The notion of purpose, the notion of why. Why do we create art? Why do we tell stories? Why do we seek knowledge and look so longingly to the stars? Why did Christopher Nolan make Interstellar? That is a question that even the movie itself seems to be asking through a very simple acknowledgement. You see, Cooper chooses to do this for two reasons. The first is that he obviously wants to give his children and humanity a future, but it's the other reason that's more interesting to me. What, because heading out there, what I feel like I was born to do, and it excites me. Cooper has this near obsession with the notion of purpose. He believes that humanity is meant to go to the stars, not stay down here and act as caretakers. It's like we've forgotten who we are, Tom. Huh? Explorers, pioneers, not caretakers. He believes that people have a greater purpose to explore and discover, a belief perhaps founded on the fact that he never really got to use his knowledge the way he was supposed to. And so, on top of wanting to give his children a future, on top of wanting to simply save humanity, he wants to fulfill the purpose he always believed was his to fulfill. And I think all that can be applied to our motives for art. Do we make art for other people to entertain them or inform them or spread an important message? Or do we make art for the people we know to address their specific issues and tell them what we think they need to hear? Or do we make art for just ourselves because it gives us a sense of purpose, because it excites us, because it's what we feel like we were born to do? And Nolan is asking those questions, exploring those ideas by pushing us to feel them as strongly as possible. By creating a premise founded in our own current sense of collective existential dread, and by utilizing simple characters to express basic but strong and pointed emotional struggles. That is the foundation Interstellar is built on, like a launch pad for a rocket, counting down as Cooper drives away and Murph watches him go in tears. Have you ever seen the pale blue dot image? It's this photo right here, taken by the Voyager 1 space probe on February 14th, 1990. And do you see that dot right there? That's us, the Earth. The photo was taken 6 billion kilometers away from the planet. There is nothing else that can be seen, just a single pale blue dot within a dark void. This image was one of the first times humanity was made aware of just how small we are compared to the practically infinite expanse of space beyond us. For the first time, we saw our home in context. And Interstellar pays a lot of attention to that kind of scale. Even when on Earth there is an attention to making the natural world feel much, much larger than us humans, whether through the massive dust storms or towering mountains. But once we reach outer space, that sense of scale becomes even more radical. As the Earth becomes smaller and smaller the farther away they get, and shots like this make you realize just how small these people are in relation to the enormity of the universe. Held in no small part by Hans Zimmer's score, equal parts awe-inspiring and terrifying. Nolan himself is known for his focus on scale. The bigger budget he's given, the greater scale he seeks to create, whether he's flipping over a semi-truck or getting as many extras as he can to fill up the beaches of Dunkirk. And particularly in Interstellar, this becomes a way to very clearly convey ideas visually, so that we can feel them, to show us just how small we are in this void and feel our stomach drop at the recognition. A very important theme of Interstellar is is the question of just how worthwhile our desires and emotions really are in comparison to all of this. Even our survival feels insignificant compared to the vastness of the cosmos. So what worth could anything less vital truly have? That's a question that comes into play rather quickly as Cooper, Doyle, Romley, and Brand, along with two robots there to assist them named Tars and Case, make their way towards Saturn, where the wormhole lies in wait. As I've already said, there are three planets with a high probability of sustaining life. The planets of Dr. Miller, Dr. Mann, and Dr. Edmonds. Miller was responsible for starting their biology program, while Mann was the person who led the original 12 astronauts to scout out the planets. Tell me about Edmonds. Oh, uh, Wolf's a particle physicist. No, no, they had families. Huh? No, no attachments. My father insisted. 
And when Brand goes into hypersleep to wait out the years it will take to get to Saturn, Cooper asks Tars, Dr. Brand and Edmund, they close? And while Tars doesn't give him a straight answer, Cooper seems to understand something. And immediately, we're shown that he's already worried about how human bias may factor into this mission if they're not careful. He's already worried that someone's comparatively small problems are going to get in the way of doing the mission they need to do. And since we've now mentioned her, I think this is actually a good time to start looking at the character of Dr. Brand. Mostly because it's in this second act that she is most crucial both narratively and thematically. And pretty much the entirety of Brand's character, as simple as everyone else's in this movie, can be seen in this. What was that? First handshake. As the crew heads through the wormhole in one of the most visually mind-bending scenes in the film, a strange sort of distortion in space shows up next to her seat. And as though on impulse, she lifts her hand to it, watching as it distorts at the contact. And once it's over and they're through the wormhole, she smiles in almost wonder at this connection with what she believes to be the beings who sent them here. And in this, I think we gain a clear understanding of Brand as someone who is willing to engage with the unknown and the strange, someone more intellectually minded and curious. She reminds me in that way of Murph, the girl who saw things being pushed off her bookshelf and wanted to know more. And Cooper is still that much less curious, much more practical man that we saw interacting with Murph in the beginning. In this very same scene, Cooper's first instinct is to try to use the controls while going through the wormhole, only to be told that they don't work here. All he can do is record and observe, and he takes his hands off of the stick very hesitantly. Cooper and Brand ultimately serve as foils to one another, something well represented in their respective titles. Brand is a scientist, and Cooper is an engineer. And according to this essay featured on the website for the Boston College of Engineering, the difference between the two is that scientists explore the natural world and show us how and why it is as it is, while engineers innovate solutions to real-world challenges in society. While it is true that engineers Engineering without science could be haphazard, without engineering, scientific discovery would be merely an academic pursuit. Essentially, broadly speaking at least, a scientist's job is to discover and an engineer's job is to apply those discoveries to solve actual problems. And that's essentially the difference here between Brand and Cooper, respectively. Brand is more focused on personal observation and discovery, while Cooper is more focused on what he already knows and how that knowledge matters practically to specific experiences and problems. And I think a very interesting way this difference manifests is in a very short experience exchange that Cooper and Brand have about the nature of evil. As the pair speak about Dr. Mann, the one who inspired the original astronauts to go on this mission, Brand says that they won't face evil out there. I don't think nature can be evil. No. Formidable. Frightening. But no, not evil. And what's much more interesting is the example that Brand uses to make this point. What was the line? evil because it rips a gazelle to shreds? A lion eating a gazelle is not evil and should not be judged as such, at least according to Bran. It is simply doing what it has to do to survive. It is not seeking to hurt a living thing for its own sake or because it enjoys the pain, it is doing it out of necessity. And in that way, evil is defined not as something done out of survival, but as something done out of malice, the pure desire to harm. And Cooper, has no feeling about this, at least not one that we can register. Brand has obviously put some amount of thought into this, while Cooper doesn't seem all that interested in the topic itself or even have his own thoughts on it, using it only to learn about Brand. And I think that's because it isn't something that really has all that much practical use to know. If a lion is going to try and kill you in order to survive, you're not really going to care in the moment if what it's doing can be classified as evil philosophically. But Brand does care, because understanding something is important to her in itself. It doesn't matter if it has a practical use, it's just something that's interesting to her. And I think this exchange shows us that Cooper and Brand each have interesting relationships with the concepts of objectivity and subjectivity. A scientist like Brand seeks knowledge and understanding seemingly to satiate her own personal curiosity and interest. And so, all knowledge, regardless of what it's used for, is meaningful and worth pursuing 
pursuing. But an engineer like Cooper seeks objective purpose in those conclusions, a practical, logical application for that knowledge. And so the only knowledge worth pursuing is that knowledge that can be used for something beneficial. But while Brand's subjective motives for seeking knowledge remain relatively steady, Cooper's objective motives often feel somewhat shaky. When the crew finds themselves nearing the planet of Laura Miller, who has been sending thumbs up and data indicating water and organics, it seems from afar like they may get lucky on their first try and find the planet they're looking for. But there's one major problem. The planet is very near to the black hole at the center of the system, Gargantua. And Gargantua has a massive gravitational pull. The gravity on that planet will slow our clock compared to Earth's drastically. Every hour we spend on that planet will be seven years back on Earth. And this immediately discomforts Cooper with Doyle assuming that he's only worried about it because of his family. But Cooper replies, I am thinking about my family and millions of other families. Okay, plan A does not work if the people on Earth are dead by the time we pull it off. And I find this response and the context in which it was spoken very interesting. Because Doyle's first assumption is that Cooper has subjective motives here, worrying about how this will affect him personally. And Cooper seems almost offended by the insane insinuation and denies it, but it's really convenient that his objective reasoning for worrying about it just so happens to include saving his own family. This objective reasoning leads Cooper to come up with a sound, logical plan for how to escape the time dilation. They will bring their station, named Endurance, into orbit around Gargantua itself, escaping the time dilation. Then they'll go down to Miller's planet, get Miller and her data real quick, and come right back up, losing more fuel but saving a lot of time. Everyone seems okay with this plan, and it's decided that TARS will stay behind to keep the ship in place, along with Romley who wants to do research on the black hole over the couple of years they'll be gone for, leaving Doyle, Brand, Cooper, and Case to all go down to the surface. And as they're breaching the planet's atmosphere, we get something that continues to show much more strongly that Cooper's loyalty to objectivity may not be as steadfast as he presents. Cooper starts entering faster than he's supposed to. Case specifically is the one warning him of this, a literal robot and a pillar of objectivity. And he's ignoring him for a couple of reasons. One, he wants to make sure he gets down there fast to save as much time as possible, and two, he trusts his own in instincts, experience, and feeling over the objective data of a robot. He even goes so far as to say he needs to feel the air. And so his own personal, subjective experiences and feelings are more important for him here than objective reasoning. It seems like in conjunction with the scene prior, Cooper is very willing to think of things objectively, but only when it suits his subjective goals. If thinking objectively doesn't do that, he's much more willing to abandon it. And it works for them here, as they manage to push through the atmosphere and enter Miller's world to find a planet of water, the stuff of life, as Brand calls it. Once they land on the shallow surface, observing mountains in the distance, Doyle, Brand, and Case exit the ship while Cooper stays behind, ready to make a quick getaway whenever they get what they came for. But they can't seem to find Miller's beacon. Miles of water in every direction, but there's nothing here. Only for Case to pull the beacon up from the water, showing that it had fallen off of Miller's ship somehow. They start looking around to try and find the rest of the wreckage, but Cooper quickly has a realization about those mountains in the distance. Those aren't mountains. The waves. And within that is another realization that those waves are heading away from them. And when Cooper goes to the back of the ship, he sees that there is a gigantic wave coming right for them. This is the attention to scale I'm talking about. Along with Hans Zimmer's music, that shot moving upwards revealing the immensity of this thing will never fail to give me goosebumps. The scale is so well conveyed and the threat is so palpable. This wave is a lion ready to tear apart a gazelle, no malice behind it. This wave may not be evil, but it is inevitable. Cooper yells for everyone to get back before it hits them, but Brand won't leave without Miller's data. But once she finds it, she can't get it and becomes stuck under a piece of wreckage. She tells them to leave her behind, but Cooper refuses. Doyle sends Case to go and get her while he starts back towards the ship. Moving quickly, Case picks her up and gets back at the same time as Doyle. Doyle lets both of them inside first, but in that time, the wave is upon them and Doyle is swept away, Cooper forcibly closing the hatch. The wave picks them up, tosses them 
him around, waterlogs the engines, and by the time the wave has passed, Brand and Cooper are alive, but Doyle is gone. And now they have to wait for the engines to drain, costing them decades of time. Both Cooper and Brand believed they were doing the right thing here, believed they were thinking about the mission. Cooper believed that getting off the planet in time was the right thing, a more practical conclusion, while Brand believed that getting the data was the right thing, a more intellectual conclusion. But regardless, neither of them got what they thought was best, and they lost one of their crew besides. From afar, Miller's planet looked perfect. From afar, those waves looked like stationary mountains. From afar, something can look like something it's not. Observing something is not the same as experiencing it. A lion may not seem evil when you watch it rip apart a gazelle from a distance, but when it's aiming to rip you apart, it can become something truly terrifying. And perhaps in that moment, it can feel evil, like nature itself is fighting against you and your desire to survive. Cooper becomes desperate, asking all these questions about how to get the years back, but Brand tells him there is no possibility. The only thing that can cross dimensions like time is gravity, and Cooper uses that information to question if the beings that brought them here are communicating through gravity from the future, and if it's possible for them, it should be possible for us, but Brand shuts that down quickly. To them? The past might be a canyon that they can climb into, and the future, a mountain they can climb up, but to us, it's not, okay? Cooper tells her that his daughter was too young for him to teach her Einstein's theories before he left, to help her understand better why he'd be gone for so long, why he'd maybe never come back. Couldn't you have told her you were going to save the world? No. When you become a parent, one thing comes really clear. Is that you want to make sure your children feel safe. And it rolls out down a 10 year old, the world's ended. His children's feeling of safety took precedence over his fulfilling a great purpose, even if it meant withholding the truth and perhaps giving them a false sense of hope about the future. They fly away from this planet of water, the stuff of life, before the next wave hits, and the camera cuts to a body face down in the water, about to be swept away by inevitability. I've waited years. How many years? By now it must be. It's 23 years, four months, eight days. The first thing Cooper does when he gets back to the ship is go to watch the video messages that have been sent from Earth, 23 years worth. He watches as his son ages before his very eyes, he watches as he falls in love, as he has a kid, as that kid dies, as so much of his life plays out before him and he's only able to observe from a distance, not to experience, not to feel anything but the grief of so many years lost to him. His son eventually loses hope that his father is even seeing these messages at all. He says he needs to let him go, and as Cooper reaches out as though to beg him to stay, a woman appears on the screen, one that the last time he saw her all those years ago was a ten-year-old girl begging him to stay. Today's her birthday, and it's a special one because he told her that when he came back, she might be the same age as him. And today I'm the age you were when you left. <laughs> so it would be a real good time for you to come back. This entire mission was built on the foundation of a desperate hope. The hope that out there circling a black hole was humanity's new home. The hope that out of three planets, one of them at least would be capable of sustaining human life. The hope that after that home was found, they would be able to get everyone on Earth there. The hope, the faith that there was a chance for us. But after what happened on Miller's planet, that foundation has cracked. The hope may not yet be gone, but it is in danger. With one planet down, there's only two other possibilities, and based on what happened to Miller, there is every chance that something similar could have happened to the other two. And not only that, but they have to choose 
between them. Because of Cooper's plan to go into a wider orbit, they lost much more fuel than they were anticipating, and thus do not have enough to go to both Mann's and Edmonds's planets. Edmonds's data is more promising, but he stopped transmitting three years ago for an unknown reason, while Mann has less promising data but is still transmitting. And the first to vote is Brand, saying that she believes Edmonds is the better prospect. Her reasoning being that Mann is too close to the black hole, referencing Murphy's law that anything that can happen will happen. Accident is the first building block of evolution, but when you're orbiting a black hole, not enough can happen. It, it sucks in asteroids and comets, other events which would otherwise reach you. But Cooper pushes back, more trustful of the person still transmitting, the one that seems just that little bit more certain. And then he drops the bombshell. She's in love with Wolf Edmund. Is that true? Yes. If you'll remember earlier when we talked about this, one of Cooper's first worries was the possibility of Brand's personal relationship with Edmonds getting in the way of the mission. And here it is, potentially doing just that, influencing Brand to pick the least likely option simply because of her own personal bias. But what's interesting is how she frames it. Maybe we've spent too long trying to figure all this out with theory. You're a scientist, Brand. So listen to me when I say that Love isn't something we invented, it's observable, powerful. Maybe it means something more, something we can't yet understand. Maybe it's some evidence, some artifact of a higher dimension that we can't consciously perceive. I'm drawn across the universe to someone I haven't seen in a decade, who I know is probably dead. Love is the one thing we're capable of perceiving that transcends dimensions of time and space. Yes, the tiniest possibility of seeing Wolf again excites me. That doesn't mean I'm wrong. Honestly, it may. It might. This is yet another of the criticisms levied against Interstellar, and again, one that I don't necessarily disagree with. It very much wears its heart on its sleeve, it is very obvious about the way that it presents ideas like this, and I can understand if it maybe comes off as over-sentimental or even preachy, pulling together both Nolan's love of heavy-handed foreshadowing and his character's tendencies to speak in thematic statements. But what's interesting to me about this particular scene is that it also seems to anticipate that. In fact, on a meta level, this scene is almost about that. Brand has fairly sound, logical reasoning for why she thinks Edmonds is the better prospect, regardless of her personal feelings, while Cooper's reasoning is based solely on the fact that man is still transmitting. And that's something that Miller proved might not mean anything. And so Cooper seems to dismiss Brand's opinion only because there is a level of emotional subjectivity to it that Cooper's opinion doesn't have. And we of course have that final exchange with that ironic reflection of an earlier piece of dialogue. That doesn't mean I'm wrong. Honestly, it may. It, it might. No, that does not make it wrong. It might. Don't trust the right thing done for the wrong reason. And here, the situation is reversed. While Brand's reasoning is sound, Edmonds is still their least likely option. The fact that he is no longer transmitting is a much worse sign than anything to do with man. It is very possibly the wrong thing to do, but it is arguably founded on the right reason, the willingness to have faith in love and follow it. And that's what Cooper is truly against here, trusting the subjective, trusting the emotional, trusting feeling. Cooper is that audience member who thinks that Brand is being too emotional, too sentimental, and that corrupts any reasoning or logic that she uses. It invalidates it. But just as with his plan for Miller's planet, Cooper's loyalty to objectivity may not be as stalwart as he claims. Your fuel calculations are based on a return journey. Strike out on man's planet and we'll have to decide whether to return home or push on to Edmonds with plan B. Just like before, Cooper's objective Objective reasoning still accounts for his subjective desires, but very soon it might not. Very soon what little hope he has left for seeing his children again may fade away, and if not that, then what little hope the human race has for survival will instead. You might have to decide between seeing your children again and the future of the human race. I trust you'll be as objective then. 
As I'm sure you can tell by now, this third act is centered around the themes of hope and faith. Brand is choosing to put her faith in her subjective feelings, the belief that love and emotion are something to follow and trust, while Cooper is putting his faith in objective reasoning, what he knows to be true, not what's simply possible. But hope and faith aren't just important out in space with this crew. It's also becoming very important to the people on Earth as we begin to cut back to what's happening with adult Murph, who is now working directly with Professor Brand to solve the gravity equation. And while Merv certainly still has hope that things are going to go right, she has also distanced herself from the feelings that defined her as a kid. In a very short scene, when she's having dinner with her older brother and his wife Lois, they offer for her to stay the night, still living in that old farmhouse Murf and Tom grew up in. But she refuses. Too many memories. She's distanced herself from this place, from the father whom she has begun to fear abandoned her, completely separating her hopeful but objective work on the equation from her subjective and somewhat pessimistic feelings about her father and his fate. Almost like she's keeping her faith in plan A in order to keep her faith in her father that has otherwise been lost. If she just solves the equation, if she just makes it work, then maybe her dad will come back. But it's not long after we we find Murph back on Earth that whatever faith she had in her work in Plan A starts to crack like the hope of the crew. As Professor Brand lies on his deathbed, he's in tears with Murph right there by his side. I, I lied, Murph. I lied to Dr. Man's planet is cold and stark. It is a vast, frozen desert of ice and snow, and when they find Dr. Man and wake him from hypersleep, he begins to sob. It's been so long since he's seen another human face. The last time I went to sleep, I didn't even set a waking date. You have literally raised me from the dead. Man claims that while his world is incredibly cold and the air has too much ammonia to breathe, there is a surface below them where the air becomes breathable and there may even be other life. And suddenly, the breath of hope starts to fill their lungs. There is a renewed sense of possibility. Maybe Miller's planet didn't work out, but here, this place, this could be humanity's new home. But then, a transmission comes through. A message from Murph to tell Bran that her father has died. And it's a hard thing to hear, but he was old after all. The chances of him surviving to see this new world were already slim anyway, so... Bran, did you know? He told you, right? This was all a sham. He left us here. To suffocate. To starve. Did my father know too? <laughs> Dad... I just want to know if you left me here to die. <laughs> Bran seems confused. She doesn't know what Murph is talking about, but man does. Professor Bran just never even hoped to get the people off the Earth. The gravity equation was impossible to solve without seeing inside of a black hole. But instead of telling that to people, he chose to lie. And I tell people, why keep building those because stations? Because he knew how hard it would be to get people to work together to save the species instead of themselves or their children. You never would have come here unless you believed you were going to save them. Evolution has yet to transcend that simple barrier. We, we can care deeply, selflessly, about those we know. But that empathy rarely extends beyond our line of sight. What man is saying here essentially boils down to the idea that they had to lie, give people a false sense of hope because of humanity's subjectivity, their unwillingness to take the logically, objectively better route because they would hold on to their personal desire to save themselves. Telling the truth would have doomed humanity entirely, so they lied. In a way, it's very similar to Cooper's own mentality. Objective, non-personal reason is superior to subjective emotional thought. And lying to keep that subjectivity in check, to make sure it doesn't get in the way, is better than speaking an inconvenient truth that will lead to despair. But this time, that objective reason isn't going towards anything he personally wants. It is telling him that he can never save his children. It is telling him that he won't be able to fulfill the great purpose he believed he was born to fulfill. And so, the best he can do is ask for them to use the rest of their fuel to let him go back in the hope that he can at least see his kids again. That's the last bit of hope he has now. 
down on Earth, Murph is trying to come to grips with what she's learned. She's talking with a new character named Getty in the credits, but I don't think he is actually named in the movie because he's really just here for Murph to bounce things off of. She's refusing to give up hope, even though Professor Brand had a long time ago. Do you have an idea? A feeling. She tells him about the ghost in her bookshelf, explaining that she thought it was a ghost not because she was afraid of it, but because it felt like a person trying to tell her something. She believes that if there is a way to solve the equation from Earth, it has to be back in that bedroom. On Man's planet, Cooper is trying to help everyone else set things up before he leaves. He wants Man to help him find secure sites for labs and habitats, but Man doesn't want to go yet, believing the conditions won't hold. But Cooper eventually convinces him to do it now, while Brand continues to work and Romley looks through the parts of Man's old decommissioned robot for an optical transmitter they can put on TARS. Romley has a theory that if they can send Case into the black hole with that transmitter, he might be able to relay the data he finds there back to Earth. It could give the people of Earth a chance. Cooper and Mann start looking for the sites, and as they go on, Mann starts talking about how strong the yearning to be with other people is. That emotion is at the foundation of what makes us human. He talks about how they couldn't send machines on these missions because they had no fear of death. Our survival instinct is our single greatest source of inspiration. He appeals to Cooper by talking about the research that says the last thing parents see before they die is their children. At the moment of death, your mind's going to push a little bit harder to survive. For them. And as they overlook a cliff, man tells him. When I left Earth, I thought I was prepared to die. The truth is... I never really considered the possibility that my planet wasn't the one. Man takes out Cooper's long-range transmitter and tosses it away before he pushes Cooper over the edge. Back on Earth, Murph has come back with Getty to that old house, but instead of finding a ghost, they find that the dust has not been kind and that Tom and his family are going to die if they stay there. But Tom refuses to listen. Man is trying to kill Cooper, trying to prevent him from leaving because they'll need the fuel to go to Edmonds' planet. Humanity cannot survive here. Man faked his data lied to everyone so that someone would come and save him. Cooper calls him a coward, and Man agrees as they wrestle in this wasteland. Murph and Tom are fighting about what to do. Tom refuses to acknowledge the truth of what's happening, just trying to push forward as he always has, and eventually it gets heated enough to where he tells Murph to leave and never come back. The hope is dying out again or at least what little of it was left. Miller's planet looked great from a distance, all that water, but when they got a better look at it, it was too much of a good thing. And Man's is the opposite. From a distance, it didn't look good, but Man claimed ardently that if you looked closer below the ice, it was actually perfect. But it wasn't. Man's planet is barren and inhospitable. It was a complete lie. Just the same way as Professor Brand's gravity equation, just the same way as Cooper promising to come back. Maybe the very idea of hope itself was a lie. Cooper manages to pin Man to the ground, and Man begins to hit Cooper's helmet with his own, trying to crack the glass even with the chance that he'll crack his own. He succeeds that ammonia air filling Cooper's lungs. He begins to suffocate as Man takes his backup oxygen and watches as Cooper flails and struggles. You're feeling it, aren't you? The survival instinct. That's what drove me. It's what drives all of us. And it's what's gonna save us. This entire time, practically everything man has said that wasn't a straight up lie was an attempt to justify his cowardice, to insinuate that his own personal desire to survive was simply an objective inevitability, that the cynical worldview that people cannot be selfless, cannot make sacrifices for everyone else, is an inarguable fact. So ashamed of his subjective fear, the fear that caused him to lead them here, that he tries to hide it behind the mask of objectivity, research, and facts. He tried to appeal to Cooper's own survival instinct for his children to try and make him more sympathetic, trying to cover up his own cowardice as human nature while he turns off his own transmitter so that he doesn't have to hear Cooper gagging and dying. Man's just doing this to survive, like a lion tearing a gazelle to shreds, but he is totally aware of the harm that he is inflicting. His shame is an artifact of that recognition. Man considered that harm in a way that a lion never would, and yet he is is doing this 
anyway. Perhaps evil is not defined by malice, the desire to inflict pain. Perhaps it is defined only by awareness, the knowledge that your actions will inflict pain, and the choice to act anyway. As Murph is driving down the road away from that house, away from that singular hope, she sees a pair of kids in the back of a truck, dust covering their faces. She doesn't know them. They're nameless, voiceless. She has no reason to care about them or about any of these other people. She's been trying to solve this equation for her, for the hope that her father might still be out there just waiting for her to do it. But now she watches these kids in the back of this truck, dust covering their faces and she turns the car around while Cooper manages to find his transmitter in the ice and call for help. Murph drives the car into Tom's fields, pours gasoline on the corn, and sets it ablaze to get Tom out of the house. Brand answers Cooper's call for help and flies towards him, managing to make it just as he's about to fade out. He tells her that Man was lying, and they both start trying to get a hold of Romley, but before they can, Man's robot explodes, having been rigged to blow if someone started looking into its data, killing Romley while Murph and Getty go back to get Tom's wife and son, and Murph goes back up to her bedroom for her last chance at finding an answer. Man steals their other ship in order to fly up to the station and take control of it, marooning Brand and Cooper who follow him up. But Man doesn't know the docking procedure for the Endurance, so he won't be able to dock safely. Brand and Cooper realize this and try to get into contact with him to tell him not to try, but he turns off his transmitter, refusing to listen. Man tries to dock, but the best he can do is imperfect, and he won't listen to the literal alarm bells in the ship, choosing to override them in his desperation. Brand tries to broadcast her transmission over the emergency PA on the station, but Man just starts talking over her, spewing his usually empty nonsense. <laughs> The station goes into an uncontrolled spin, heading into the atmosphere of man's planet. And at this moment, Cooper begins to push forward in an attempt to dock, trying to match the rotation of the Endurance. Case tells him it's impossible, and Cooper just responds that it's necessary. And there has never been anything so mundane and slow as a spaceship trying to dock that has been this captivating to me before. A big part of that is Zimmer's score, of course, but another part of it is the tangibility of the scene. Nolan is well known for his obsession with getting as much in camera as possible, to the point where it's become something of a joke. But in scenes like this, it matters. With the use of physical miniatures instead of weightless CGI creations, we are seeing real, tangible things engaging in this action, engaging in this supposedly hopeless pursuit. The movements feel real and imperfect, the desperation feels genuine and sincere, and Cooper, with the help of TARS, slowly but surely lines the ship up, moves forward, locks in, slows the ship down, blasts the main engines, and pushes them out of orbit. It was hopeless. It was all hopeless. There was nothing left to believe in. Everything was just a lie, and yet at the sight of kids with dust-covered faces, in the desperation of human beings to survive, to push as hard as they can, to keep going, regardless of the odds, a father and daughter both refused to give up hope in a hopeless situation. Maybe according to the equations, or the probability, or the numbers, there is no hope. But maybe we make our own hope, our own faith. After all, isn't that what faith is? Believing in something you have no reason to believe in? Everything quiets down as Brand and Cooper laugh at the absurdity of their survival, but it's not over yet, because as Cooper was pushing out of orbit, there was an unintended consequence. We're heading into Gargantua's pool. After stabilizing the condition of the Endurance, Cooper comes up with a plan. They don't have enough fuel to get back to Earth, but Cooper thinks they may be able to get to Edmonds' planet if they go into orbit around the black hole and use its gravity to slingshot them towards it. And as for the extreme time slippage that would cause for them, well, neither one of us have time to worry about relativity right now, Dr. Brand. 
They're going to use their landers as boosters to get out of the black hole's orbit, with Cooper and Tars each controlling one manually. Tars will detach once his is spent and go into the black hole in an attempt to relay the quantum data like Romley suggested before, but also because they need to shed the excess weight if they're going to escape the black hole's gravity with enough fuel still left to get to Edmonds. Newton's third law. The only way humans have ever figured out of getting somewhere is to leave something behind. They go into orbit around the black hole, speeding along the horizon line, so tiny in comparison to this massive cosmic prison of light. They reach terminal velocity and the landers begin firing their engines, forcing them out of orbit. Tars detaches, being sucked into the black hole, and Cooper's ship prepares to detach as well. They don't have enough fuel or resources to carry both of them. Brand will have to go alone. Brand protests, but Cooper reminds her of Newton's third law. You've got to leave something behind. Cooper detaches, falling into the darkness, heading past the event horizon and into the black hole, into the unknown and the unfamiliar, something no human has ever seen before. When Cooper began this story, he was a stubborn man unwilling to listen, unwilling to explore or anything that wasn't founded in something he already knew. And now, he's going into something far, far beyond the scope of human knowledge to let someone else go on. The lights begin to go out in his ship. He's losing control, flashes of light and dark. His ship is beginning to fall apart under the pressure. He becomes lightheaded as the computer tells him to eject. He does so, entering into the blackness alone and silent before falling into something. It's a strange visual, but it looks like Cooper is behind a bookshelf. Murph's bookshelf. When he knocks over some books, he sees her as the young girl he left behind on Earth. As we cut back to adult Murph, standing in that same bedroom trying to figure all of this out. Cooper is distraught. This place is nonsense to him. It's Murph's bedroom, but splayed out infinitely, no end in sight. As he floats through whatever this structure is, he is reminded of all the moments he now regrets while we watch Murph go through the same memories herself. And as though by instinct, he begins trying to find some way to communicate, to change the past, to get himself to stay. He starts using Morse on the bookshelf, dots and dashes based on the gaps. Murph is going through the same thing herself, trying to understand. She pulls out her notebook from all those years ago where she wrote down one small word. And Cooper watches as he leaves her behind on that last day. And he's begging from behind the bookshelf, screaming and yelling at Murph to make him stay. Don't let him leave. And on the other side of time, Murph realizes that there would only be one person, one ghost, who would ever have told him to stay. Once you're a parent, you're the ghost of your children's future. Before we have any clue as to what this place is, or why Cooper is here, or what is even kind of happening, Nolan asks us to feel. To feel the fear, to feel the grief, the regret, to feel Murph's realization that her father never wanted to leave her behind. Nolan asks us to feel. After all of this occurs, Tars manages to come in on Cooper's transmitter. He tells him that they saved them and pulled them into their five-dimensional reality, creating a physical space out of time itself. Something like what Bran told Cooper about earlier in Act 2. And through gravity, Cooper is able to exert a force across space-time. And with that, things start to make sense to him. These bulk beings have access to infinite time and space. They aren't bound by anything in the same way that we are. They can find a specific place in time. They can't communicate. Cooper realizes that he was never the one that was meant to save humanity. It was Murph. His role in all of this was just finding a way to tell her. His purpose in this wasn't to be the one to save everyone, it was to give his daughter the tools she needed to do it herself. His purpose was to be a caretaker. The climax of this movie, this spacefaring epic of incredible scale and scope, is a father figuring out how to communicate with his daughter. It is both extremely, strangely intimate at the same time as it lies almost completely out of comprehension, and yet, if I just let myself get taken into it, if I just let the music and the visuals sweep me away, if I just feel it, I can understand it. 
maybe not perfectly, but in every way that matters. The bulk beings aren't bound by anything, but we are. Bound by our limited understanding of dimensions and space and time, sure, but also by our own nature. Our capacity for logic and objective reason binding and being bound by our capacity for emotion and subjective feeling. Because without one, the other has no purpose. Without logic, feeling is aimless, perhaps even dangerous, but without feeling, logic is cold and hollow. Without objective observation and an adherence to the facts, feeling has no foundation. But without subjective understanding and a belief in emotion, logic is meaningless. Without the binds of each other, neither one is worth anything. Interstellar is a movie about balance in a lot of ways. It's a movie where Miller's planet is too much of a good thing and man's is not enough. It's a movie where the subjective and objective are consistently at war with each other, desperately vying for superiority, but maybe, just maybe, they were never meant to be in conflict at all. Maybe they are just two sides of the same coin. Maybe feeling is just another way of understanding. And I think this all comes together beautifully in the symbolism of the watch. Cooper thinks of the watch that he gave her all that time ago. That's how he's going to communicate the quantum data to her, coded in Morse into the second hand. But he can only do this for her while she's still a kid, while she won't know what to make of any of this information. So Tars asks the perfectly reasonable question of what if she never came back for it. But Cooper is insistent that she will, and when Tars asks how he knows, because I gave it to her. We see Murph grab the watch and she notices it again with a new perspective. The second hand twitching seemingly randomly, but no, not randomly. Murph goes on to transcribe the data, write it all out, and solve the equation. The answer they had been looking for all this time was just waiting for her to be ready to see it. The watch is obviously a thing to objectively measure time, but like time, it is subject to perception. This specific watch was tied to her father and all the feelings that came with him, and she was never willing to look at it closely enough to see what it had hidden within it. Perhaps she was too scared that what she would find was a lie, and it was only when she saw the love of her father believed in it that she was able to see the code in the watch. The watch stands as a symbol for both love and time, faith and science, feeling and reason, hope and reality, subjectivity and objectivity. It's all so interwoven that the degrees of separation are imperceptible. Love can transcend time, it can mean something, even be felt long, long after it was actively present. Love can echo through space, reverberate through the stars, and become the reason for humanity's very survival. It was always love. Maybe years ago, I heard that and thought that it was cheesy and silly and cringeworthy. Maybe I thought it was too obvious or too easy. Maybe you think that now, and I don't know that you're wrong. It is obvious, it is easy, it is cheesy, sure. But all the criticisms I have brought up about this movie, I have also agreed with to some extent. I think those criticisms are valid. They make sense. They're based, at least on some level, on objective observation. But what I want to ask you to do, if you haven't already, is to go somewhere new. Somewhere you may not have gone before. Somewhere that maybe possibly is even a little bit scary to go to. It is for me sometimes. I want you to give yourself over to it. Embrace it. Stop trying to dissect it. Stop looking for plot holes that I know are there. Stop trying to figure out if it makes sense logically. Stop fighting it and just feel it. Feel the fear, feel the regret, the awe and the dread, the passion and the joy and the pain. Feel it. The love woven into every frame, every word of the script, every note in the score. There's one last thing that Cooper realizes as the bulk beings start to close the Tesseract. They're not beings. They're us. What I've been doing for Murph, they're doing for me. For all of us. According to Cooper, they are humans who have evolved beyond the four dimensions we know. And they are reaching down through time 
to help us. I read the bulk beings as some form of god here. Beings of seemingly infinite power who still care about us tiny, insignificant humans. Something so completely illogical. But here Cooper's saying that we are them. They are us. And the one thing, the singular constant between us, is love. That strange, powerful force as natural as gravity or time. Maybe that's what it means to be made in God's image, however you want to perceive a god or gods. Because beyond everything, beyond our very perception, there is love. 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 And Cooper reaches out his hand as he makes contact with someone who tried to tell him that. Someone he didn't believe at the time. And she reaches back, and in that connection, there is everything. And out near Saturn, there are lights blinking. Cooper wakes up in a hospital room on board Cooper's station, named after Murphy Cooper. She's still alive, and she's coming from another station to see him. And when he goes into her room, he finds an old woman surrounded by the family she's made for herself, the ones that she will be a ghost to someday soon. And he takes her hand, and he tells her that he was her ghost, and she says that she knows. Nobody believed me, but I knew you'd come back. How? Because my dad promised me. He says that he's here now, but she doesn't need him to be. She has her children now, and no father should have to watch their child die. She tells him instead to go to Brand, because she's out there, setting up camp, alone in a strange galaxy. Maybe right now she's settling in for the long nap by the light of our new sun in our new home. Constellations are strange. The idea of certain stars in the night sky together making up some kind of picture. Even though just looking at them on their own, it's very hard to see what any of those old astronomers were talking about. But somebody saw it. Somebody looked at those stars and saw a bear, a harp, a lion. Somebody looked at a seemingly random collection of bright dots in the night sky and found images, pictures, animals, instruments. They found beauty and art. I think it can be hard to trust that beauty is there sometimes. I think it can be hard to have faith that it even exists with everything else around us. But I think that's why we started making art in the first place. Art is exploration and observation, meeting desire and feeling. It is our attempt to find beauty in the mundane, hope in the hopeless, love in the natural. Art is made up of both the logical and the emotional. It is built on the foundation of both objectivity and subjectivity. It is our observations of reality, blending with our perspectives and biases and experiences, not in any intentional way, but simply because they go hand in hand. And to dismiss one is to ignore the purpose of the other. I feel that some people have this strangely adversarial relationship with movies and stories and art. Like some people watch movies specifically to fight against them, and the goal of the movie should be to fight back against its viewer, push past their defenses, and force them to enjoy it. And a movie that can supposedly do that is then termed a good movie. I know I was like that once, but now I think that's exactly the wrong way to experience art or at least to me, it's the least useful or fulfilling. I think vulnerability is as important in watching movies as it is in making them. You have to open yourself up to a movie if you're going to truly engage with it. You have to be willing to meet it where it is. You have to be willing to suspend your disbelief in order to believe. You have to be willing to feel it in order to understand it. And maybe you won't feel anything. I'm not saying you will, but you might. And feeling it may mean learning things about yourself that you may not like or that you may not know what to do with yet. It may mean realizing you made a mistake or that you did it all wrong and now it's too late. It may mean realizing that your only option now is to go back out there and find what really mattered all this time. But if not to realize that, 
then why else are we watching movies? Why did Christopher Nolan make Interstellar? I can't say for certain. I don't know that Nolan himself even could, but I can tell you one reason. Because if this wasn't true, I don't think the movie would exist. I think he made it because he felt something in it. Interstellar is so grounded in science as we understand it, to the point where an entire book was written about how the science of Interstellar mostly holds up. But it is a movie about how there are places science cannot go where feeling can. The feeling of a father learning to accept that he's just here to give his children the tools to live and learn and love. The feeling of a daughter learning to believe that her father did love her and that if we lose sight of that love or ignore it or fear it, we lose everything that makes survival worthwhile in the first place. This is a film about what we leave behind. The memories and the ghosts. The feelings. Nolan's films aren't just about the unreliability of perception, they are about the strange, horrifying, and beautiful way in which finding beauty is just a matter of believing that it's there. Murphy's Law. Anything that can happen, will happen. That includes pain, but also joy. It includes fear, but also faith and hope. It includes death, but also life and love and the art we leave behind is our way of navigating this truth. It is our way of communicating what we feel and why we feel that way. We tell stories that are fake, create worlds that aren't real, witness the lives of people who have never lived and never will. Because through fiction we give life just enough order to better understand it, while still leaving just enough chaos to better feel it. Fiction is the lie that tells the truth, as Neil Gaiman says, because something doesn't have to be real to be true, and not everyone has to see what you see for it to be there. Sure, constellations may not actually look like bears or harps or even lions, but I truly feel it's beautiful that humans can look up at the sky and find paintings in the stars.